So, you wish to know of us. You wish to know what drives us. What makes us who we are. What makes us different to our brother Astartes. I can tell you this very simply. It is in our faith. It is in our vows. There are four, and they are thus. Suffer not the unclean to live. Uphold the honor of the emperor. Abhor the witch. Destroy the witch. Accept any challenge, no matter the odds. So we all have sworn, so we all do. For none have ever broken these oaths in ten thousand years of our eternal crusade, and none ever will. For we are the right hand of the God Emperor. We are his purest sons. We are his punishment. We are his vengeance. For we are the Black Templars. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, and I wish to introduce you to the factions and forces of the Warhammer 40k universe. I pray you will forgive me for the vigor of this video, but it is now impossible to brook this subject without a modicum of reflected zeal. Do also please bear in mind that this is an introduction only. I will release more entries on this chapter as I am able. At this point, I would like to mention that I have done some entries on Rogal Dawn, the Primarch of the Imperial Fists, from which the Black Templars are descended. If you have not seen it and do not know of the life of Rogal Dawn, it may be a good time to put this video on pause and check that out whilst painting or pottering. It would lend more context to that which we discuss today. Now, with the extensive throat clearing performed, let us get into the heart of the matter. Today, let us explore the history, legacy, and character of one of the most dangerous and fanatical of the forces at the Emperor's command. Let us explore the Black Templars. What is your life? My honor is my life. What is your fate? My duty is my fate. What is your fear? My fear is to fail. What is your reward? My salvation is my reward. What is your craft? My craft is death. What is your pledge? My pledge is eternal service. What is your duty? To serve the Emperor's will. What is the Emperor's will? That we fight and die. What is death? It is our duty. Of all of the chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, this is perhaps one of the only two successor chapters that have managed to outshine and become more popular with the fanbase than their originating legion, but it is not difficult to see why. For in all the galaxy there are few forces, Xenos, Imperial or Chaos, that can liquidize the bowels of their enemy, so much as even the whispered mention of this glorious chapter. The Black Templars are the Emperor's wrath made manifest, but they do not rely on a curse of corn to do so, as the Blood Angels do. They do not rely on the forces of witchcraft and warp manipulation, as the Grey Knights are verily designed to do. Nor do they have a genetic predisposition to berserk rages or canine attributes, as the Space Wolves do. They rely on will, faith and courage alone. The Black Templars are fanatics of a level that would impress, if not intimidate, even the Adeptus Subroretas. They are the clenched fist of the Emperor. They are the wide cold anger of their father, Rogal Dawn. 
They are the thing the Chaos worshippers fear. They are the burning brand, the righteous chainsaw, the blessed bolter. They are the men who purge all that is unclean. Woe to the mutant, the heretic, and most especially the traitor, should they be in the path of the eternal crusade of the Black Templars. For the Black Templars have never known lasting defeat. They have never bowed to pressure, and they have never simply obeyed orders and knelt before Gulliman and his cursed treaties, the Codex Astartes. That during the darkest of times, they have been the fire that has given light to the righteous and burnt the foes of the Holy Emperor and his Imperium. In their copious annals of glory, they have almost single-handedly saved the Imperium from tyranny. They have never rested and never repented the oaths their ancestors of the Blade swore ten thousand years ago. The Black Templars are vengeance manifest. They are purity, they are faith, and they are relentless. Now, gentle listener, let us explore why they are so different to their cousins and brothers of the other chapters of the Adeptus Astartes. For this, we must go back over ten thousand years. We must go back to the very beginning of the chapter, and the darkest period in human history. We must revisit the horror of the Horus Heresy. Only by doing this can we begin to understand the depths of the drives that have propelled the chapter through the many millennia that have come after. We must go back to the very siege of terror, the scouring and the iron cage. We must steep ourselves in this history, so we can understand the righteous rage that is within the souls of the space marines who wear the black and white of the Templars. So, let us begin. The Emperor of Mankind arose in a period that was hell. Humanity was almost removed from the galaxy, and its annihilation seemed inevitable. The man who has only ever been called the Emperor or the Master of Mankind then arose to guide, lead, and save our entire race. He forged an army of super soldiers, genetically engineered human males of huge sizes, most being over eight feet tall. All had multiple organs that were added to them over time, making them into true post humans and the most lethal biological human force the galaxy had ever seen. These soldiers were called the Adeptus Astartes, the Emperor's Space Marines. Originally, there were twenty legions, each taken from the genetic template of a being more akin to a demigod than a man, beings called Primarchs. They were to be the generals of the Emperor's armies, a job they were not only forged to perform, but did so with aplomb, each a titan on the battlefield, in the command tent and in personal combat, with abilities as far beyond their genetic sons as the marines were above standard humanity. With these crusading armies led by their godlike fathers, the forces of humanity could not be stopped. They went out into the galaxy and conquered, liberated and pacified the vast majority of the Milky Way. When final victory seemed in sight, the Emperor of Mankind left his most able son, Horus Lupercal, in charge of the end of the endeavor. The Master of Mankind returned to Terra, what we now call Earth, and took up his most secret project. A trial so secret that he did not even inform his sons of his intentions or his labors, their goals or expected results. It was a mistake that would change the course of human history forever. When the Emperor had left the Great Crusade, his sons, the Primarchs, fell to petty bickering, and the son he left in charge of his brothers, Horus Lupercal, fell to evil. He was seduced by the dark powers of Chaos, who are the enemy of the Emperor until his dying breath. And using the powers of Chaos and his own knowledge of his brothers, their enmities and grudges, Horus in turn persuaded a full half of his brothers and their armies to declare for him also. The Horus heresy had begun. As the leader of the crusade, he managed to send all of the Primarchs he knew would be loyal to their father to the furthest reaches of the galaxy. He spread them thin, 
or led them into traps so that they could be removed from the picture. When enough had been done, Horace Lupercal finally turned his cloth and declared himself in open rebellion and attacked all of the facilities, colonies and forces that would not forswear their loyalty to the Emperor and bend their knee to him. Rogel Dawn, the Primarch of the Imperial Fists, was one of the few that were near terror and would not surrender. Rogel fought a war against his brothers Horus and all of their armies for the better part of a decade, but eventually, inexorably, they fought their way to the birthplace of humanity, the throne world of the Emperor, Terra. Rogel and two of his loyal brother Primarchs, Jagatai and Sanguinius, were all that were able to be present to defend the Holy Palace on Terra against twice, if not thrice, their number in Primarchs and their legions of Astartes. Also, their adversaries had the corrupting powers of chaos on their side, and thus were able to summon hordes of demons from the darkest corners of the warp. Malign entities that were of vast power. Yet Rogel and his brothers held their line and slowed the armies of Horus. They never gave up and never surrendered. They fought for every inch of ground, every system, every light year of space. The cost of the war was catastrophic. You may ask what this has all got to do with the Black Templars. Well, let me explain, gentle listener. For Rogel Dawn was the father of the Imperial Fists. They were taken from his genetic makeup and were of a similar temperament, mind and steel as he. And it is from these Astartes, these Space Marines, that the Black Templars were taken. Now we must go into one particular nuance, another titan, another legend of the age of which we speak. It is the man, the Marine, called Sigismund. In a time of legends, where the Emperor and the Primarchs bestowed the galaxy like deities, where the ranks and numbers of the Space Marines were at their very zenith, and their deeds were worthy of epic poem and bardic song, there was one who outshone all of his brothers and cousins. Sigismund. It is often said that with the exception of the Primarchs and the Emperor himself, there has never been a more lethal and skilled human to grace the entire human race. During the Great Crusade, his name was hailed as the mightiest and a peerless jewel that adorned his legion. This was to be proven beyond any shadow of doubt when the heresy reached its crux moment during the Siege of Terror. Sigismund fought during the entire heresy for his legion, the Seventh, the Imperial Fists. He was the first captain of the legion and its greatest light. When Rogel Dawn, Sanguinius and the Emperor left the palace by teleportarum to take the fight to Horus on the very bridge of his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, Sigismund was one of those left behind. He was left behind to lead. He did so from the front. Sigismund was granted the best armor and weaponry that could be gained and then tasked to act as the Emperor's own champion. He was to represent the Emperor in the defense of the palace. As the champion, he was to locate and confront the leaders and heroes of the sieging army of his brother Astartes, the traitors. In this function, he challenged over a score of chaos champions, demons and twisted marine officers. He dispatched them all in short order, nor did he do so with bolter or plasma gun trickery or traps. Every single last one of them was challenged, confronted and defeated in personal combat. Blade to blade, steel to steel. He brought all low with his courage, faith and skill alone. His ability was only ever outshone by his conviction and faith. With these attributes combined in this role, he was unstoppable. When Horus had been slain by the Emperor, which is a tragic tale I will explain on another day, the forces of Chaos broke and fled. What followed was a war that saw all loyalist forces of the Imperium chase the traitors across the galaxy, inflicting defeat upon defeat upon them. The traitors were hounded remorselessly into a tear in real space that led to the realms of the Warp, called the Eye of Terror. This campaign was called the Scouring, and Sigismund was one of the loyalist warriors that was inflamed with zeal, ever in the vanguard of every battle fought by his legion. 
but it was never enough. Mogul Dawn and all of his sons, the Imperial Fists, would never forgive themselves for what they construed as their failing in allowing the Emperor to be crippled that day on the bridge of the vengeful spirit. Thus, their own self-loathing was enshrined within their breasts and led to a cold rage that could never be satisfied, never be slacked or sated. When this was done, civil war loomed again. When Rabut Galman supplanted Rogel as the head of the Loyalist armies and dictated that the legions should be broken into lesser units of only a thousand Astartes, called chapters. Rogel and his son, Sigismund, would not countenance this horror, this infamy. Rogel declared Gilliman a coward, but when naval forces began to engage Imperial Fist vessels because of their rebellion against the dictator Rubut Gilliman, civil war loomed again. Alas, Rogel had to decide between compliance or another civil war, a civil war that the human race might not survive. Rogel Dorn knew his sons would never willingly comply, so purposefully he led them into a massacre arranged by their worst enemies, the Iron Warriors Traitor Legion. The trap was called the Iron Cage, a perfect maze of fortifications arranged for that one purpose only, the destruction of the Imperial Fists. The butchery was great, and only few Marines survived. Rogel sacrificed his very sons to the altar of Rubut Gilliman's Codex Astartes, his writ, his new order. With only enough Marines left to form very few chapters, so great had been the toll taken by the Iron Cage, there were not enough Marines left for any form of rebellion. Thus, Rogel achieved his goal, the aversion of a second civil war, for his men were broken. All but one. Sigismund. The remnants of the Imperial Fist Legion were broken into chapters of 1,000 men, but only few. One, the Imperial Fists, were made up of Rogel Dorn's veterans. The Crimson Fists were made up of the youngest and most hopeful sons. There were others, but records differ, for it has been over 10,000 years since this event, and they will gain their own entries in the future. The last chapter to be formed was to be made up out of the most zealous, the most fanatical, the most aggressive of all of the sons of Rogel. There could never be any doubt who would lead this chapter. It was Sigismund. My tabard, the white of sun-bleached bone, offers a stark contrast to the blacker than black plate beneath. The heraldric cross stands proud on my chest, where Astartes of lesser chapters wear the Emperor's Aquila. We do not wear his symbol. We are his symbol. Reclusiac Grimaldus of the Hell's Reach Crusade Sigismund showed lip service to the Codex Astartes for a period, but was driven by a fire that few could even conceive, let alone match, and his plans and pathways soon permitted him more leeway. For Sigismund forged his chapter now, he alone. He was unfettered by convention and precedent, and no longer had his melancholy and stern father to gainsay him in any decision. Thus Sigismund forged a weapon that reflected his own character, his own drive. Thus was the fire of zeal lit, a fire that has never dimmed in all the long millennia of the Imperium. Thus were their Black Templars formed. When they were forged, Sigismund reinstated his vows as champion of the Emperor, and then expanded on them. Thus were the four great vows of the Black Templars taken by the entire chapter and have been retaken by every leader, officer, or initiate of the Templars ever since. Abhor the Witch. Smite now the scions of the Witch. Grant us the strength to pierce their unclean flesh, to cover their fields with the pale forms of their blasphemous dead, to drown the thunder of guns with the shrieks of their dying, to lay waste to their citadels with hurricanes of fire, 
to wring the hearts of their kin with unavailing grief, to send them into the wastes of their desolate lands, in rags and hunger, broken in spirit, worn with travail, and begging for the refuge of the grave. We ask it in the spirit of wrath, O master of mankind. Black Templar's vow, abhor the witch, destroy the witch. Lead us from death to victory, from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from faith to slaughter. Lead us to his strength and an eternity of war. Let his wrath fill our hearts, death, war and blood. In vengeance, serve the Emperor and the name of Dawn. Suffer not the unclean to live. Prayer and vow of the Black Templars. Trust in the Emperor at the hour of battle. Trust him to intercede and protect his warriors true as they deal death on alien soil. Turn their seas to red with the blood of their slain. Crush their hopes, their dreams, and turn their songs into cries of lamentation. Uphold the honor of the Emperor. Vow of the Black Templars. O Emperor, in wrath rejoicing at bloody wars, fierce and untamed, whose mighty power doth make the strongest walls from their foundations shake. O conquering master of mankind, be pleased with this war's tumultuous roar. Delight in swords and fists red with alien blood and the dire ruins of savage battle. Rejoice in furious challenge and avenging strife, whose works with woe embitter human life. Accept any challenge, no matter the odds. Prayer and vow of the Black Templars. With these vows in place, the Templars are very unlike any of their brothers and cousins in other chapters of Space Marines. They do use heavy weapons and ordnance, as they are not idiots, but the use of devastation squads is far more limited. They are in fact a rarity due to the vows, due to the second vow. But sometimes even the Templars need to use heavy weapons to clear away particular foes. As stated, they are fanatics, but they are not idiots. Another main difference in their organisation and deployment on the field of battle is how they intake and train their forces. The vast majority of Astartes chapters follow the Codex Astartes, the Tomb of Tactics and Organisation written by Reboot Gilliman, Primarch of the Ultramarines. In said treatise, their Astartes are directed to take Marines into their scout companies at first. These companies are grounds for training and for gaining experience before the younger Marine joins the battle line proper. When scout training has concluded, they are then funneled into tactical squads, who are armed mostly with bolters, but are capable of meeting most threats. They are the backbone of a chapter, as these squads do contain a heavy weapon and specialist equipment, but only few, so the unit has incredible tactical flexibility. Marines will then progress to more specialised roles in either close assault units or heavy weapons units. From there, they progress to the first company and become one of the veterans of the chapter, if they are deemed worthy by dint of their heroism and skill in decades of combat. This regimen and pathway is utterly ignored by the Black Templars. There is much to be said for the way that the Templars train their Marines, for a reason I will go into in a moment. Templar candidates who are recruited from worlds they pass on their unending crusades are, as with other chapters, put through incredibly gruelling testing. But from there, the similarity ends. For Black Templars are not placed in scout companies. The Templars do not own such things. They believe that training and the acquisition of the metal needed to be counted amongst the number of the Black Templars comes only from direct field experience and the fires and fury of battle. So when a candidate becomes an Astartes, their biological, biological changes and enhancements complete, they become a neophyte. Every neophyte is then taken on as a futuristic squire to a more experienced Templar, known as an initiate. These initiates are actually fully paid up members of the Templars. 
They will personally train the neophyte in all aspects of war. They will take them into battle at their side and give them the most harsh and brutal initiation into the life of a frontline Templar, charging into the midst of the heart of the enemy in their very first sally. Thus do Templars gain on the spot training and a baptism of fire that sees a tragically high number of them left scattering battlefields across the galaxy in their hundreds and thousands. The death toll in the Black Templars is excruciating compared to the statistics of others. But those Templars who are finally deemed to have worth and shown true faith, tenacity, fury and ability are then some of the most rugged and able of all Space Marines. Thus, the tactical squad does not exist for the Black Templars. They call these squads, made up of experienced initiates and their neophyte squires, Crusade Units. Nor are they regimented and organised into pretty orders of battle that other adherents to the Codex Astartes must arrange. For in the Black Templars, one fights at the side of those one wishes to fight at the side of. And this can change. Thus Crusader units are not forced or created by some bureaucratic rule. No. They are formed by colleagues of like-minded Astartes merely organising themselves into units to meet threats. In this way, the Black Templars are far more flexible and amazingly driven. They see a threat and meet the challenge, any challenge, head on. They do not have a designated sergeant in charge of a Crusader unit, as they are all of one mind and one purpose. They are simply not needed. These seemingly small differences to their brothers of chapters who follow the Codex Astartes can cause issues when they are deployed amongst larger campaigns. So the Black Templars attempt to make sure that they are in such force and such numbers that collaboration is simply not required. Although they will never refuse a call for assistance from a brother chapter, they will do so on their own terms and will not yield command or control to those who follow what they consider the dogmatic and inflexible structures, tactics and strategies employed by the Codex Astartes. Simply put, the Black Templars fight their way or not at all. Due again to the second oath, there is much less emphasis placed on the training and accuracy with a bolt gun or rifle that is usually one of the defining factors of an Imperial Fist successor chapter. For the Black Templars, the oaths are living, breathing things and may never, ever be avoided, even if this would mean they lose an encounter. Thus, the emphasis of training and combat ability is almost exclusively funneled into peerless ability with close combat weaponry. Only the Blood Angels in the midst of a Black Rage, or the Sons of Lehman Rust, the Space Wolves, could hope to come close to the close quarters potentials of a Black Templar. But even then, it would be a close run thing. When an initiate is deemed to have served with colossal honour, then they are permitted to join the Order of Sword Brethren, the Codex equivalent of the Veteran. From there, should they survive decades or even centuries of close combat with the most vile and unspeakable creatures in the galaxy, or from the warp, can they be promoted to leadership? But this is always dead man's shoes, as with other chapters. The most significant difference in the Templars and their peers are twofold. One, they do not have a home planet or planets that they defend and from which they draw their aspirants, those who would be space marines. The Black Templars robustly recruit from every last world they cleanse, save or pass. Their need for new warriors is a hunger that cannot be satisfied, as their war is never ending. Two, the Black Templars are the only chapter or organization that have kept the fires of the original crusade alight. For the Black Templars have taken oaths that they will never tire, they will never stop, they will never relent until the entire Milky Way galaxy is free from the Tate of the Xenos, the Mutant, the Witch and the Traitor. Thus they live and breathe, move and die aboard vast crusade fleets. The crusade for them never ended. The Black Templars also use this practice to flagrantly ignore the limits on the number of Astartes, of Space Marines, that can be kept under the one banner, the one chapter. 
It is said that the only one person in all of the Imperium who knows how many Templars there are is the High Marshal of the Black Templars. No others. It is true that the attrition rate among the chapters is eye-watering, but their intake is organised to more than make up for this rate. More than. Hence, it is suspected by many that the Black Templars, if gathered in one place, could potentially equate to the numbers that could only be described as a full legion. It is known that inquisitors or nosy bureaucrats of the administratum who take too close an interest in the requisition of materials, those who attempt to truly discern the numbers of the Templars, are often likely to have lethal accidents. The Templars do not tolerate any interference in their activity. None whatsoever for they see their mandate as coming from the Emperor himself, and bow to none but he. But a full muster of the entire Black Templars has never, and probably never will, happen. For the Black Templar Crusade fleets are in most parts of the galaxy, bringing the fire of wrath and the light of purity to all regions that they deem to require them, which is all regions. For the heretic, the witch, the Xenos and the traitor know no shame and respect no boundaries. So thus the Endless Crusade must follow them and root them out wherever they rear their foul heads. Many a disagreement has occurred betwixt the Templars and the local lords of a region, but the Templars do not ever care to take any heed. For if the local lords had been doing their job, as the Emperor has decreed, then their presence would not be required. Thus, if their presence is required, then the local lord, chapter, or militarum are beneath contempt, for they have failed. When a region is pacified, the crusade will then go on. But they also can leave training camps on planets at their discretion. If this happens, then the initiates will take their neophytes into combat as before, but locally. This usually only occurs when a region has been cleansed, but the Templars know that it will not remain so for evil is always obstinate, and never knows when it is beaten. Thus, there are centers of Templars across the galaxy, as well as the main strength of the various crusading fleets. One can only wonder exactly how many of them there are. What dire need, what terrible threat, might be required for the High Marshal to give the clarion call to resound so fiercely across the entire galaxy that he would recall every last one to a muster. The thought alone is terrifying. So we get onto one of the most important elements of the Black Templars. Faith. In the long years of the original Great Crusade, there was a simple truth to which all of humanity was to be illuminated, what the Emperor demanded be promulgated, the Imperial Truth. The Imperial Truth was very simple, but will require full entry in the future to cover its nuances. For the now, you only need to know its basics. The Imperial Truth stated that there were no gods, that religion itself was one of the greatest enemies of humanity, and any religion was a lie. There were no spirits, there was no afterlife, and there was no god. Most chapters of the Adeptus Astartes still adhere to the Imperial Truth, but this is not so of the Black Templars. The Templars have replaced the Imperial Truth with one of their own, and many of their peers sneer at this change. The Templars are of the ardent belief that the Emperor of Mankind is, in fact, the God of Humanity. This is no hyperbole, no lip service and no whimsy. They believe this with every fibre of their being. Any aspirant who does not allow this faith to infuse every aspect of their mind, heart and soul will be rejected, no matter how adept or how much potential they may have in any or all other disciplines of war, no matter how they could be a shining light to adorn the chapter, if they cannot take the faith of their Emperor's Godhead into them, then they will be rejected. The faith of the Black Templars is terrifying to all. They are holy warriors and take the name of their campaigns, Crusades, quite literally. 
They are warriors who have been charged by their god, the Emperor, to strike down his enemies. They believe that he watches them at all times, as he is omniscient. They believe that he has the power to intervene, as he is omnipotent, as any good god should be. But he does not do so, as they are his champions. Each Black Templar believes that every action, every deed, every moment, they represent the God Emperor of Mankind. This religious fervor has built them into a force that is nigh on unstoppable. Where others would perform a tactical withdrawal, where others would seek to regroup and redeploy to better confront a superior foe, the Black Templars not only stand firm, they push forward. I have stated before that the casualty rate amongst the chapter is unprecedented, for this is one of the reasons why. Their drive to face enemies blade on blade, no matter any disparity of size or power, is one factor, but their unquenchable zeal is the other. They do not run. They do not cower behind walls or parapets. They do not allow for long sieges or protracted bombardments of placements. They charge. One might say this is foolhardy at the very minimum, but it has been their way for over 10,000 years and will never change. They do not throw lives away, gentle listener, but they just construe any challenge whatsoever as one to be met head-on and can be goaded or let into traps with comparative ease. Those who do manage to lead the bully of the chapter into a trap often find that they have woefully underestimated the mettle of their victims. The amount of times that a Black Templar force has made a trap into a massacre is uncountable. For those thinking that they have trapped the Black Templars often find that they are the ones caught in a slaughterhouse as the dauntless fanatics tear through their number like a hot breeze through corn. Anyone wishing to attempt to trap the Black Templars had better be prepared for the fight of their lives, for usually it is their last. The fanaticism of the Templars to their faith has other effects. Although once, long ago, they are recorded to have had psychers amongst their number, this is no longer true and has not been for some time. Definitely a tale for another time, though. Ever since, they have not only been without psychic support, they have actively refused to fight alongside any force that contains what they consider a witch. There is only one exception to this rule. One, the Grey Knights. As the Grey Knights are the direct progeny of the Emperor, their genesis is the genome of the Emperor himself, not a Primarch. They are deemed to be the only psychers that the Black Templars will tolerate on the same field of combat as they. The zeal of the Black Templars is such that over time it is proved to seep into their very weapons and equipment of war, as mad as that may seem. There are reports that the very machine spirits of some Land Raider Crusaders, huge battle tanks with troop transport capacity, has been affected by the constant exposure to the Black Templars, so much so that it has infected them. More than one report of a vehicle's machine spirit impatience for the fray has led to them being discovered in the camp of an enemy, the vehicle itself going forward and exterminating everything in an enemy camp where the Black Templars were at prayer before the fray. Although other chapters or organisations would lock in horror at this form of independence of action and activity, the Templars lured the vehicle for its righteous anger, its wish to serve the Emperor more directly. Also, it is a sign of their power and faith that despite having no psyching ability whatsoever, the Templars can disrupt the powers of the warp that may assail them. Their faith in the Emperor is quite literally a shield from the powers of corrupting bodies and the bolts and blasts of the Witcher like. They are not immune to the mightiest of psychers, but the untrained or weak, or distracted or overconfident, has often sneered at a Black Templar and extended their hand to electrocute or annihilate them, only to find their vaunted powers fizzle as the night rams a blade through their chest. Truly, for the Black Templars, the Emperor protects. Black Templars are, however, so zealous that they can leave a bloody wake, for no psycho, mutant, abhuman or suspected traitor will ever be left to infect the Imperium as a whole. The wiping out of all life from a planet 
can be a regular punishment decreed by the Templars. One could not count the millions of humans that have been slain by the Templars in their cause. But one must always remember their history and the goal to understand how such seeming callousness can be done in the name of the Emperor. For the Black Templars, they will never forget the Horus Heresy, nor the events of Old Night. They know that to sacrifice even the population of a world of billions must be weighed against the survival of the entire Imperium and trillions. They have witnessed personally and regularly how the machinations of just one powerful cycle or demon can drag an entire sector and hundreds of worlds into a hell. Better to prune the rose bush and have it healthy than to allow a rot, any rot, to spread. With the stakes so high, the Black Templars would never shy away from any task, no matter how brutal, no matter how terrible it is to perform. For they are the hand of the Emperor. They are his champions, at least in their minds. Also, the Oaths remove any and all chance of working with alien races. What the Imperium calls Xenos, no matter how common cause may be in play. It is with stunned confusion and rage that many an Eldar army has expected the forces of humanity to join them in a raging battle against chaos, only to find that the Black Templars will charge both sides at the same time. The Black Templars give no quarter, ever, for no reason whatsoever, will a champion of the Emperor, a Black Templar, ever meet or treat or suffer the Xenos to live. It is at this point that I must conclude my introduction to the Black Templars. To go further would take us down a veritable plethora of extensive rabbit holes. But rest assured, gentle listener, I shall revisit this topic in further entries in the near future. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. If you have enjoyed my introduction to the Black Templars, please consider liking and subscribing. If so, then please do remember to press the notifications button. I would not wish you to miss out. Also, if you are a regular gentle listener, then do please consider supporting us on Patreon. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun.